I'm going to pass out. Good. It looks like we will have enough copies. Um, I'm going to pass out a handout, just so you know what you're looking at. There's one, oddly, this is actually from the 20th century, but it gives you a rough idea of just where Britain's colonies in Africa were. There's also a map of uh, submarine cables, uh, the kind of 19th century, we might call it, information superhighway, also British naval bases. And then the final map is a breakdown of foreign investment for the major colonial powers and where it was directed. So please pass this around. We'll have a chance, hopefully, to refer to it individually in sections um, as the class goes along. Now, this is a huge subject and obviously a controversial one. I've already touched on some of the themes of interest, uh, especially in the first week. Um, if you remember when we were talking about this whole question again of why the West, that is, why it was the Europeans colonizing the Americas as opposed to the other way around. But then also the question which is not always asked, which is why it was the West Europeans, that is specifically really the population of these tiny countries like England, after all a rainy island in the North Atlantic, why, why did these countries colonize the world? Very large questions, obviously not easy to answer. Um, Part of the answer, as you've learned, I think, especially from the Paul Kennedy book, is this notion of competition between the European countries. The military revolution, the frequent wars, led to innovations in things like mobile cannon, which eventually were mounted on gunships. Those of you who saw Master and Commander last week, you got an idea. I mean, because it dealt with a rather peripheral episode. In fact, it was really an amalgam of two novels at once. Uh, a rather peripheral episode in the Napoleonic Wars, but the reason that those two ships, and there are only two of them, remember, those of you who watched the movie, why this was so important, because basically, whichever ship beat the other ship could pretty much control the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, because there weren't other ships like that. You know, these were ships that had mobile cannon. These were ships that had the capacity to travel around the world. Now, oddly, as we remember, the Chinese used to make ships like that in the 14th and early 15th century, but then they stopped. So Europe was really the only continent making ships like that. So that the real rivalries as far as kind of strategic control of the oceans, remember the English and Dutch fought a series of wars in the 1600s, then what we looked at kind of the third and the fourth week, uh, England and France, particularly in the Napoleonic period, but going back even a hundred years before that, were fighting these wars in part over control of the shipping lanes, in part over things like the Sugar Islands. In fact, this is something that actually most Americans don't know about their own early history. Like any country, we tend to think that we're very important. You know, all countries like to think they're important. So the Americans like to think, well, America was always like this, this great thing. You know, as soon as it was settled, uh, people talk about, you know, the abundant fisheries off Newfoundland, although that's in Canada. They talk about the thriving agriculture. I mean, the first settlers talked about, you know, the colossal size of some of the things grown in America, things like the potato, obviously, corn. That you could also take European plant species and plant them in America. You could bring over livestock and cattle, and everything thrived because of the abundance, because of the weather, uh, the heat, and all the rest of it. Well, to some extent, that was always true, except it was really not until pretty late in America's colonial history that it really had its own economic significance. In fact, in the early days, America was basically an adjunct, that is to say, it was kind of a secondary economic consideration. That is, America grew the kind of foodstuffs and produced the basic manufactures which they needed in the Caribbean sugar islands, because that's where the money was. The real money was in sugar. Now, tobacco, it's not that tobacco was nothing. If you look at the main products, tobacco, of course, that's, you might call it, America's uh, contribution to the world. We were all able to smoke tobacco. Even back then it was controversial, oddly enough. I mean, in the early days, they would advertise it as this great health tonic. You know, you would, you would smoke tobacco and it would cure, uh, you know, the grip or the cough or this or that. Although even in those days, people said it was bad for you. They weren't sure yet about the medical effects. The thing about tobacco, though, it was extremely easy to grow, and it was, in fact, very easy to produce. All you really needed to do was just to kind of, like, dry out the weeds. Uh, I mean, this is even true of, uh, you know, shall we say, marijuana today. One of the reasons it's so hard to eradicate, much as governments try to, 
It's very easy to grow. I mean, people grow it like in their kitchens, little hydroponic glass farms, you know, next to their kitchens. It's not that hard to grow, and it's not that expensive to produce. So that the, the early tobacco farmers, it was a classic example of agricultural overabundance. They made so much of their product that they undercut its price. And the other thing is tobacco, yes, it's sort of a luxury, and a lot of people like to smoke it. But it's not like sugar. I mean, sugar is an absolute necessity. I suppose before people consumed sugar, maybe they didn't know that it was a necessity. But once they started growing sugar, you kind of can't imagine life without it. You can't imagine your tea without it. You can't imagine not having pastries, you know, cookies and sweets made with sugar. So sugar was, for various reasons, much more profitable. It could be grown in enormous quantities, sold almost anywhere in the world for a good price. One of the big problems with sugar, though, and the reason that the Caribbean islands, I mean, it, again, it's kind of like our notion of even colonial economics is distorted, at least in part because America becomes an important world power, and so people tend to think America must have been kind of at the center of this story. American slavery, the Civil War, you know, all these books about it, all these best-selling novels and retrospective histories, Hollywood movies made about the Civil War. Slavery in America was kind of an odd thing. In some ways, the reason it became such a kind of controversial issue in the 19th century, yes, cotton picking was something you really could not do very easily without slave labor. It was such backbreaking labor. That's true. But in the Sugar Islands, the labor was far more backbreaking, and the casualty rates were much higher. In fact, one of the reasons I think the Caribbean islands, although they had periodic slave rebellions, did not in the end become as notorious as the American South is because so many of the slaves died that they weren't actually able to even reproduce. America's slave population exploded because the slaves actually started having children. Because, not that their lives were easy, of course they weren't, but they were actually able to survive and reproduce. Whereas in the Caribbean islands, it was just like a revolving door. The labor was so horrible, the climate was so atrociously hot and humid, so many of the slaves died that they just kind of brought in new slaves every year. And the colossal profits of the sugar industry allowed this to happen. I mean, eventually you had this thing, and again, we're going to talk mostly about Britain today because Britain was the most important power. But we should remember, of course, that the Spanish and the Portuguese got there first. You know, initially, the British, I think I said in their, in their early phase, I called them kind of pirates, and that was literally true. I mean, you might call it like the Johnny Depp era of imperial history. <laughs> they were just trying to rob all of the, the gold and silver shipments coming from Spain. Eventually, the British learned that, you know, there was a lot more money in cultivating things like sugar. But the French actually were there at the same time. That's one of the things they fought about was control of the sugar trade. Was I going to write up here? Yeah, eventually you had what was called a triang uh, triangular trade. It had something also to do with the wind currents. Um, basically, if you kind of timed it correctly, you could catch the winds. You know, so you would start off in England and go to Africa. You would pick up your slaves and then go from Africa to uh, usually one of the Caribbean sugar islands and then from there uh, back to England. In fact, slavery was not very important in the early days of American colonization. It became important later once they started cultivating cotton. But tobacco, as I have said, was not particularly difficult to grow. And in fact, in the early days, it was no one's intention to bring in African slaves. In fact, the British is funny because like early on in their imperial history, they actually had an anti-slavery attitude. And they said, we're not going to use slaves like the Spanish do. Then they changed their minds once, once they had grown sugar. And then later still, of course, they had this phase of kind of Christian moralizing when they turned against the slave trade and actually tried to stamp it out. Obviously, there was all kinds of hypocrisy. Um, there's, there's a fantastic section in uh, Neil Ferguson's book, um, came out about six or seven years ago in Empire, where he talks about um, the author of that, that famous Christian hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. You've probably heard it in, I don't know, does it sound familiar? Movies? Anything? No? It's an old Christian hymn. Well, I guess maybe it didn't make it all the way to Turkey. But anyway, it's a very popular Christian hymn, which you know, is spread around the world. Well, the interesting thing is the author of this hymn was actually a slave trader. <laughs> So that you, you can tell the hypocrisy at times was pretty extreme. I mean, he was this man who was a Christian who would give these kind of lengthy disquisitions on notions of liberty. Um, I think his justification for the fact that he was making his money by 
you know, acquiring slaves off the coast of Africa and then selling them. It was something about how the Africans were still heathens, you know, who had not been converted to Christianity. It would only occur to a later age to actually try to convert them to Christianity. In his own, shall we call it, kind of an 18th century mind, the idea hadn't really occurred yet. It wasn't until late in the 18th century, early 19th, that the real abolition movement began with its very Christian inspiration. But obviously, I mean, people of all shapes and colors have always had a capacity for hypocrisy, and so obviously a lot of these people were able to tell themselves that what they were doing was you know, Christian and moral and just and all of that, even though, of course, it wasn't. We should also remember, of course, that the slave trade happened on both coasts of Africa. We're going to talk mostly today about the Atlantic trade, the one called the triangular trade, that is triangular kind of you know, England or, I suppose, France, North Atlantic, Africa, Caribbean island. Um, the East African slave trade, uh, the greatest of the slave markets, the famous one was at Zanzibar on the East African coast. That was, of course, mostly the province of the Arab and Persian slave traders. Um, and there were differences in emphasis. It's often said that slavery in the Ottoman Empire, for example, was fundamentally different from that practiced in the kind of Western colonial world. And that's true, um, partly because of the traditions of you know, things like what you might call almost lifestyle slaves. I mean, when you would buy concubines and that sort of thing. And so you would pick them based on their beauty, and it would have more to do with whether they pleased you than with anything related to labor. The thing that made, I think, the, the African slave trade in the Atlantic so particular was this whole problem of climate. I mean, that's what made it particularly cruel and nasty, but also what made it really work so well, what made it profitable. Uh, I said that tobacco was not as important as sugar in the slave trade. Um, and it's partly because it was easier to grow, but it's also partly because Virginia, which is on the eastern coast of the modern United States, as you probably know, actually very close to Washington, DC. In fact, parts of Washington are actually technically in Virginia. Virginia, which is where the colonization began in the early 1600s, which is where they kind of discovered and first cultivated the tobacco plant. Now, as you know, if you've ever been to Washington, DC, the climate is not pleasant in the summer. <laughs> it's very hot and humid. But it's still kind of just bearable. Now, of course, if you're doing back-breaking labor in the fields, it's a little bit less than bearable. Um, a little bit further south, like in Georgia, in the kind of classic cotton country, it's even worse. It's nowhere near as bad, though, as it is in places like Jamaica. I mean, basically, when they even tried to have white Europeans you know, harvest the sugar cane in Jamaica, you know, they would last like a week or two. I mean, literally, they would just die out. You, know, you can look at things like mortality rates in the British Empire. And in fact, uh, there's some great tables of this. Um, New Zealand, I think, had the, 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 the highest sort of rate of non-mortality. That is, uh, most English people who actually settled there survived. Um, other places like Sierra Leone were kind of in the middle. Uh, the Caribbean islands, you know, it would be maybe like one in four or one in three would die. Actually, in the early days, it would be more like one in two. Virginia, too, is pretty bad. In fact, one of the early kind of um, economic factors involved, um, because the people emigrating, yes, some of them are the great landowners, you know, who get some charter from the crown to, you know, rule over a certain territory. Many of them, though, of course, were laborers, as you would expect. Uh, there was a phenomenon called indentured servitude, which is not quite slavery. Um, it would be more like this. You, know, you might have had some debts or you might have taken out some debts to pay for your passage that is on the ship that would send you from you know, England or Ireland uh, to the colonies usually in America. In exchange for this debt that is for your voyage, you would then have to labor essentially without pay for an extended period of time, possibly five years, 10 years, 12 years, what have you. Um, so that in the early days, that was kind of the idea. It was more like they actually preferred to settle the territory with whites, with other Britons. Actually, later on, they would even bring them in from places like Germany. The problem is they all kept dying. I mean, that's literally why they eventually started bringing slaves to America, too. In places like Virginia, later further south, South Carolina, and Georgia, the climate was simply atrocious. It was, of course, not as bad as the Caribbean, but still, to someone born and raised in the British Isles, in a rather cold and rainy island being put down in American heat and humidity. Now, I mean, it's one thing when it's 35 to 40 degrees, as you know. I mean, it's often that hot in Ankara. It's another thing when it's 40 degrees and 98% humidity, right? It's a very different thing. And then it's another thing still if you're out working in the fields in that kind of heat. So in the end, that was really the argument for slavery. 
It was partly economic that, yes, slaves, well, you know, they labored for free. Obviously, you didn't pay them. On the other hand, they weren't entirely free because you did have to house and feed them. And, of course, you actually had to pay to ship them across the Atlantic Ocean. So from those perspectives, you would think it actually might be expensive. And it wasn't cheap. On the other hand, it was cheaper. Um, it was cheaper at least so long as the economics remain you know, as they were. You know, in a later era, once kind of health and sanitation and so on were better, it was easier not to use slaves. In the earlier era, it was slightly easier to use slaves, although the main knockdown argument was simply that African slaves were able to survive the climate. Um, you know, this had actually been true in, in off the coast of East Africa and in, in the hotter parts of Asia as well. This is one of the reasons why the slave trade furished, uh, furn uh, flourished as well in the Indian Ocean, was that there were certain places where really only African slaves could kind of handle the heat and the weather. It's a cruel fact, but a fact nonetheless. That's not to say they all handled it. Of course, many of them died on the ships coming over. Many of them died again while laboring, particularly in places like the Caribbean. But fewer of them died than did the white indentured servants coming from places like England. Now, that said, once things were kind of like up and running by, I have these kind of different eras here. To the early era, this is let's say like the 1600s, this is when the English are still sort of backwards, you know, they're still trying to kind of like copy from the Dutch to rob the Spanish gold shipments and so on. You know, it's in this next era, the 18th century, that the, Brit the British Empire kind of begins to come into its own, you know, where they actually start seriously colonizing places like the Americas, setting up crown colonies and islands. This is when they get big in the sugar trade, you know, when tobacco and then other American products like corn and potato become important. When they start, you know, importing large numbers of African slaves, the triangular trade is kind of at its height and so on. Um, the next era, these, these numbers are all, you know, not precise. I mean, like, if you look at when slavery was forbidden in the British islands, I think it was 17, let's see if I have it right here, I think it was 1773, 1772. Um, that is inside the British islands, the actual United Kingdom. Slavery is uh, abolished in 1772. Uh, it's abolished the trade that is in the British Empire, trading, buying, and selling is abolished in 1807. And then finally, it is um, the actual use of slaves, which is different than the buying and selling of slaves. That is banished in 1833. So there are very different eras that we're going through. Um, I mean, there are kind of like important crux points. I mean, one of them was actually the American Revolution, in part because... You know, when you look at it from a couple of perspectives, I mean, this is America's own kind of cross to bear in its own history. Obviously, the original sin, as it's sometimes called, of slavery. The British were already, at this point, starting to think about abolishing slavery. And there was even some discussion of it by the so-called founding fathers in America. They had to make political compromises with the southern states to keep them in the Union. And so the southern states decided... They absolutely needed slavery, because by that point also cotton was important. Um, there was this very notorious clause. It was called the, the Three-Fifths Compromise. You probably haven't heard of this one, have you? Um, basically, the southern states, states like South Carolina, Georgia, Florida was not a state yet, later it would be, um, even North Carolina, eventually Kentucky, the slave states as they were called, the kind of the old Confederate South. Well, they all wanted, when it came to apportioning political representation, they wanted the slaves to be counted, because after all, the more people you have, the more representation you might have, that is in a parliament. On the other hand, the slaves obviously had no rights. I mean, they couldn't vote or anything like that. So they actually came up with a compromise. They counted them as three-fifths of a person for the purpose of the census. It's one of these kind of very dark and you might call them cynical compromises of early American political history. And in fact, in some ways, slavery might have been dying out anyway, if not for something I mentioned in the lecture on the Industrial Revolution, which was, I keep talking about cotton. This is, again, it's this, this kind of like seemingly small thing of epical importance, the invention of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney in, 18, in 1793. Now, this is why, because in cotton, you have to deal with these, you know, these tiny, annoying little seeds that you can't really you know, weave the cotton until you get rid of them. He invented this machine for essentially culling them out of the cotton. 
um, which was extremely difficult. You had to do it you know, by hand. That's one of the things that slaves had to do. But that said, you still had to actually cultivate the cotton in the field, so they still needed the slaves. And in fact, this led the global production of cotton to explode, which meant it kind of like led to a whole new era of slavery in the American South. So that to a certain extent, slavery, it's not that it's dying out yet in the Caribbean. It's still there. But you remember the French also abolished slavery, at least technically, under the terror government that's in the 1790s. Um, they later changed their minds under Napoleon. But the British were already talking about forbidding slavery. They're already starting to wind down the slave trade. But then in America, slavery takes on a life of its own. Because, I mean, if you think about this, after all, the slave trade is effectively abolished in 1807 by the British. Yet, as we all know, the American Civil War, which was fought not only about slavery, there were other issues like states' rights and federalism involved, but the kind of the big issue was slavery. And that was fought from 1861 to 1865. The slaves in America, the Emancipation Proclamation was in 1863. They weren't really technically freed until after the Civil War. And even then, of course, there were legal restrictions and so on. But so you have like a 50-year gap here, right? Remember, Britain controls the sea. So Britain has now basically gotten rid of most of the global slave trade, at least in the Atlantic, by about 1807, 1810. And yet American slavery persists for another 50 years. That is where this phenomenon took place that I mentioned a little bit earlier. That is that the American slaves actually survived and reproduced. As you would expect, because after all, where are they getting the slaves otherwise? The slave trade is now illegal. And so in the American colonies, slavery actually flourished like never before in the early 19th century. Um, Britain, though, was turning against slavery at the time. Um, I mean, even some Americans were. The abolitionist movement, um, which is, you know, I think it's something to know about because there was no counterpart anywhere else in the world. I mean, this is the one thing, again, it doesn't make an apologia for Western slavery, but it does help to keep in mind that even though you know, the Western European countries profited greatly from the African slave trade. It was eventually the British who abolished it. And it came very much from this Christian missionary impulse. I mean, slavery, it had been practiced very widely, of course, in the days of the Roman Empire. But in Europe itself, it had largely died out by the medieval period, mostly because of Christianity. The Europeans, as I said, came up with a kind of hypocritical, um, you might call it a justification again, for enslaving Africans. Well, partly, of course, because the Africans were enslaving themselves and then selling these slaves to the Europeans. By the 19th century, though, for various reasons, the slave trade had come to seem not just unchristian, but literally repugnant to Europeans. Um, in America, in the North, like if you know your Civil War history, or even if you watch, um, is there a question? Comment. Is there a comment? <laughs> Oh, she asked you something, OK. Um, if it's something I can help with, go ahead and raise your hand and let me know. Um, so that in, in the American colonies, it was mostly the northern states. Yeah, some of this was a bit of humbug. The northern states didn't really require slavery in the same economic sense as the south. The climate was different. The products were different. And so you, you might say it gave um, a place like Massachusetts, the, basically the, uh, the epicenter of the American abolitionist movement. You might say it was kind of, um, it was easier for them to get up on their rostrum and moralize about slavery because their economy didn't depend on it in the way the southern economy did. That said, though, the sentiments were real. Um, you know, there were abolitionist newspapers, literature, pamphlets. Uh, this was even more true in Britain than in, of course, the northern United States. And all of it eventually led to a concerted effort, literally by the British Navy, to stamp out the global slave trade, where they actually began intercepting slave ships and literally impounding them off both coasts of Africa. They were not able to entirely eradicate the slave trade. I mean, even today, of course, there are countries in the world where slavery is practiced. But they basically did eradicate the large-scale slave trade, particularly in the Atlantic. They were less successful in the Indian Ocean. I mean, it took them another six or seven decades to make any inroads in places like Zanzibar, which was on the eastern coast of Africa, the largest slave market in the world. Eventually, they had to essentially bribe the Sultan of Zanzibar to promise him that they would come up with some other way for his regime to make money other than, of course, by buying and selling slaves. Now, 
A lot of this then, again, there's a Christian missionary impulse involved, but there's also a kind of odd economic argument. It goes together with some of what I talked about when we discussed the Industrial Revolution, the idea of free labor, which actually kind of intersects with this notion of laissez-faire. I mean, a term to describe all of this together, you might call it something like um, Christian liberalism. Again, there are elements of, shall we say, you know, unrealistic or contradictory notions or humbug in this too. When I say humbug, I mean you don't know quite how seriously to take everyone who professes the ideas because not all of them live up to them. But the idea being this, on the one hand you have like a moral argument that looks slavery is simply wrong and it should not be practiced. On the other hand you have the economic argument that it, slavery is inefficient. Inefficient, again, because the costs are hidden, you know, the costs of either bringing the slaves over, you know, feeding them, housing them, clothing them. And also that the slaves might not be motivated to work in the same way that free laborers would. Like this is something you heard a lot in the time of the American Civil War in the 1860s or right before it. The argument that the northern states made, you know, which is that basically their own kind of economic system was superior because it was based on free labor, that is the labor of free men. Again, somewhat glossing over the long history of indentured servitude. There was something to it, productivity, in terms of productivity. Economists, again, economic historians still debate this kind of thing. Obviously, the early slave trade must have been profitable or people would not have engaged in it. However, at some point it probably did become true maybe around the same time as the kind of abolitionist movement developed, that slavery was no longer as profitable and that in fact economically it had become inefficient and possibly even uncompetitive. So there's an economic argument which is now beginning to underlie the kind of Christian or moral argument. Now all of this comes together, I mean in very interesting figures like, my own favorite is David Livingstone. He was kind of almost like a one-man exploring. I'll talk about a couple of other men today, all British. I'll mention up here also Richard Francis Burton. They're, you know, two different various sides, you might say, of 19th century British imperialism. David Livingstone, because he was actually a doctor as well as a Christian, represented, you might say, kind of like the best impulses of 19th century British imperialism. Uh, in some ways, people like him and the abolitionists, you might even say prefigured what we tend to call NGOs today, that is, non-governmental organizations, which, you know, again, depending on how you look at it, which either try to alleviate the burdens of the poor in the world or try to impose Western values. Because, after all, in a way, many of them do the same thing at once. That is, they're doing both things at once. They are literally concerned about, let's say, the well-being of the poor or about women's rights and issues like that. On the other hand, though, they often go to countries where their values are really not universally shared. In the case of Livingstone, it wasn't, again, that he was necessarily just trying to impose his own vision on everyone but that he had to see some of the contradictions of what it literally meant. You had a kind of a clash of civilizations. It, there's a very interesting quote, I think, which encapsulates what I'm talking about. Um, you know, he goes to Africa. Uh, he actually, unlike many of the other Britons, he actually came in from the east. And so, kind of like from the area around Zanzibar and Madagascar, and eventually he traveled up the Zambezi and discovered uh, Victoria Falls, you know, the great, kind of the greatest waterfall in Africa, um, which he named after Queen Victoria, although of course it was later reverted to its uh, native name. Um, but anyway, he says after, again, numerous encounters with tribesmen, you know, he's trying to give them the sell about Christianity, you know, telling them about you know, how all people are brothers and, you know, they're all equal in God's eyes. Um, telling them also about you know, certain other Western values, also about things like literacy and you know, science and medicine. It's sort of like a one-man band of you know, Western imperialism. Um, but interestingly, he said that a lot of these Africans actually were happy that white men were coming, you know, contrary to what we sometimes hear, that it was all you know, tension and conflict. However, not for the reasons that the white men thought. He said, they wish the residents of white men not from any desire to know the gospel, that is Christianity, but merely, as some of them in conversation afterwards expressed it, that, quote, 
By our presence and prayers, they may get plenty of rain, beads, and guns. <laughs> and of course, later, you know, things like beer. <laughs> I mean, things, not that they didn't have their own, usually uh, kind of like alcoholic drinks made from things like bananas and that sort of thing. But, you know, Western imports, basically. They decided they liked trinkets, particularly if, like guns, they gave them immediate advantages. Um, you know, that's not to say they didn't always listen to the message of Christianity. They must have. I mean, in fact, today, this is not a generally known fact, although, of course, if, if you do some reading on it, you'll learn this, that the fastest growing religion, contrary to what you sometimes hear, is not actually Islam. It, it is actually Christianity. It's actually growing faster than Islam today um, by conversion, and mostly in Africa. Um, it's, of course, an open question whether it's the same Christianity that's practiced in the West or in a place like America or in Europe where, frankly, Christianity is pretty much dying out. Um, there's obviously a lot of elements of kind of paganism and you know, magic and, and superstition and so on. They infuse it sometimes with their own values. But Christianity actually did take root in Africa. Again, whether it took root because people understood the gospel or whether because the Europeans seem to know about things like, you know, medicine and disease. I mean, that, that's another thing that the, um, the whole era of African uh, colonization, in a sense, was made possible by quinine, uh, which is essentially, it's like the physic which you use to inoculate yourself against malaria. Um, until this was invented, you know, virtually no white Europeans had ever really ventured into the African interior, you know, for more than like a day at a time, simply because they would almost always suffer from malaria. Um, I mean, an issue which actually still reverberates today in things like global environmental politics, um, the controversy over DDT, for example, which dates back to a bestseller by Rachel Carson published in 1961 called The Silent Spring. It was one of many things she talked about in that book, but in some ways the most controversial because she said that we shouldn't be spraying DDT because it was a carcinogen and was going to affect you know, people's um, you know, nervous systems and other various things about health. Or as it turned out, it was, it was an essential way of preventing the breeding of mosquitoes. And many people think that the banning of DDT actually led to millions more deaths from malaria than would have been otherwise necessary in Africa. Um, but anyway, quinine, the spread of European medicines, you know, people like Livingstone, who actually venture up into the interior of Africa, again, some of it is, you know, spreading the gospel. I mean, remember that when we're talking about these Christian missionaries trying to ban slavery, it's not just on the oceans, like the Navy. They're trying to keep the Africans from practicing it themselves, right? Because it's the Africans, after all, who are enslaving other Africans. And again, you know, as to whether the arguments are taken literally or not, it took a long time for most of these ideas to take root. However, there was definitely an era in British imperial history where all of this was taken very seriously. I mean, an era that, in a way, Dr. Livingstone um, embodied. I sit here roughly 1857. It's not that everything suddenly changed in 1857, but this was, although it didn't happen in Africa, it had a lot of impact on European imperialism. This was the, uh, uh, the date of the so-called Indian or Sepoy mutiny. I haven't talked that much about British India yet. British India, in some ways, was far more important for British imperialism, in fact, in most ways, than was Africa. Africa is it's sort of like the crux point of modern controversies about imperialism, particularly because of the scramble for Africa in the 1880s and 90s, which I'm going to talk about in the second half of the lecture. But we should always keep firmly in mind that India was the main focus for British imperialists when they're talking about trade, when they're talking about prestige, when they're talking about kind of great power rivalry, you know, with the Russians. India was always far more important economically. Um, in fact, when the British would eventually send troops to places like Africa, it was actually mostly Indian troops they sent. Um, the British Empire never had a very large army, if you're talking about like an actual standing army based in Britain. They had a much larger standing army in India. But anyway, until 1857, Britain did not really directly rule India. You know, there were various colonies, various so-called uh, princely states, uh, a kind of interlocking patchwork of different types of pseudo-imperial governance structures. The footprint of Britain in India was always fairly light. In fact, there's an interesting fact about this. When the, when the British finally left, you know, in the, in the 1940s, partition which led to the creation of you know, Pakistan, India, eventually, you know, also the Bangladesh you know, split off, it was originally East Pakistan. 
After the partition and after the British left, um, I don't know the original source for this, but supposedly they did this public opinion survey, you know, to see if people were happy about the British, you know, having left. And apparently the number one answer was, who were the British? <laughs> All these people hadn't really known that they were there. They, they might have heard of these kind of mysterious sahibs, you know, who had a different color skin or whatever. But, you know, India, of course, was also famously divided, you know, among the castes and so on. And the British always ruled it basically through other Indians. I mean, the, the British never had more than about 4,000 civil servants in India. And as far as their own troops, uh, they didn't have much more than that. What they did is they ruled it through proxies. You know, they ruled it basically through Indian proxies. But that said, the British presence and the British control, I mean, you, you could never completely deny the fact, even if you could camouflage the fact. And at times, of course, it would come out in the open. Um, I mean, there were major episodes of violence in the 18th century, too. But the one, the crowning one of them all was the so-called Sepoy Mutiny of 1857. Um, you know, an episode which, to some extent, also has obvious kind of, shall we say, reverberations or implications of interest for the world today. You know, you hear different versions of what set it off. It had to do with a, a new uniform that the sepoys, um, sort of like the Indian, uh, you know, the, the grunts or the infantry, you know, the British Indian Army were wearing. And that's something to do with a cockade which they put, I guess, I don't remember whether it was actually on the chest or on the head, but that supposedly it looked like it had been made either of the kind of the hide or the skin of a pig or a cow. Now, interestingly, of course, if it were a pig, that would offend Muslims. If it, if it were made from, you know, a cow, cattle, that would offend Hindus. And so in either case, the British were in trouble, right? And no one really knew what the truth was, but these rumors, I don't know what started, but these rumors started, like, swirling around and eventually led to, you know, widespread mutinous sentiment in the ranks of the army, you know, the storming of various fortresses and citadels, you know, the murdering of various British officers, you know, also some of them, you know, their wives were killed, raped, etc. Then, of course, it was repressed with, of course, uh, the kind of brutality you might expect. You know, the British, like I said, they ruled with a light footprint most of the time, but whenever they were challenged, they tended to res respond with overwhelming force when they could. Um, you know, they would do this, you know, even when, let's say, a couple Britons would be taken hostage in some place in Africa, they would send in, you know, almost in the style of the kind of NATO or American style punitive raid today. N not the large scale thing like you have in Iraq, but more like, I suppose you might call it like a cruise missile strike. You know, they would send in like a rapid reaction force. In India, they had enough troops on the ground where they didn't really need reinforcements. But the thing which made it all so kind of explosive and controversial was the religious issue, right? It was kind of like, for whatever reason, whether it was the Hindus or the Muslims that had started it, it had to do with, with Christianity. It had to do with religion. It had to do with the fact that the British had begun to kind of push this missionary impulse in India. In fact, ironically, you might say that the British had less trouble in India back when they just acted like you know, rapacious opportunists who were trading. Once they started to, yeah, not to put too fine a point on it, once they started to bring their wives, <laughs> honestly, that was a very important development because when you're just talking about like single young men on the make, they would tend to marry the native women. In fact, in the early days of the British presence in India, many of them would tend to quote unquote go native. Um, I mean, after all, for a Christian, you could kind of see the appeal. Uh, I mean, it reminds me once, there was a conversation between um, a British officer and the Shah of Persia. And this is sometime around the time of the Napoleonic Wars, like circa 1800. I'm sorry I don't remember the names, but it's a great conversation. The Shah of Persia tells the Briton, he says, I've heard a rumor which astonishes me. I am told that the King of England has only one wife. <laughs> and the Briton says, yes, that's true. Christian men may have no more. And he says, but can't he have a woman on the side? And the British officer says, well, no, that would be unbecoming a Christian who must set an example for his subjects. A sovereign must always set an example for his subjects. And, you know, the Shah kind of thought about this. He said, well, I, I suppose I see what you mean, but all I can say is I would not wish to be the king of such a country. <laughs> this, this is the same Shah who, by reputation, had something like, 
you know, 87 children and uh, like 384 grandchildren, you know, who had, shall we say, uh, taken advantage of his position in the world. Um, so that this actually, to a lot of Britons, you might say, was an interesting argument in favor of going native. Um, whether it was, again, to have more than one wife or whether it was simply to mess around on the side. Um, now, famously, the most interesting example of this, there's a British imperialist called Richard Francis Burton, or as he's sometimes called, Sir Richard Francis Burton. Now, I don't know if I believe this, but the story about Richard Francis Burton is supposedly that by the end of his life, he knew 29 languages. I mean, whether he knew them in the sense that he could converse fluently in them and well, a lot of them didn't produce things like newspapers, so you don't know whether he could read the newspapers. But he could supposedly at least like get by. He also supposedly memorized the entire text of the Quran in Arabic. He was the first Westerner to visit Mecca in disguise, where he supposedly had like a little slip of paper about this size and a pencil, and he would just take it out and like take notes, knowing that, of course, if it were discovered, he was an infidel, you know, on pain of death, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, although Considering he had memorized the entire Quran by heart, supposedly, again, I don't know whether you really believe this, um, he was able to pass for a Muslim. Um, I think we're almost towards the end of the first hour, but it's, it's great to end with him because he's such a fascinating character. He also, this, this might actually interest you more, he not only did the first English translation of uh, the Thousand and One Nights, do you call them the Arabian Nights? You know, the tales of like Ali Baba? and the 40 thieves. Uh, do you call them in Turkish uh, Arabian, or do you call them um, Thousand and One Nights? Sometimes they're called the Arabian Nights. Sometimes they call them the Bin, what, Bin Bir? Bin Bir Gece. Bin Bir Gece, right. So he translated the Bin Bir Gece, the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. He also translated the Kama Sutra. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the secret of Richard Francis Burton when it came to, shall we say, learning languages. He said, the first thing you do whenever you arrive in a new place, you visit the local brothel. <laughs> and, and that's how you will learn the language. Now, not, not unsurprisingly, he supposedly developed a number of venereal diseases during his life. One of the saddest things, though, about the Richard Francis Burton story is this. Believe it or not, he eventually did get respectable. And he actually married a proper English wife when he was like, probably like 45 or something like that. After he had shall we say, sown his oats <laughs> a little bit. When he died, his wife went through all of his papers and correspondence and notes, which he had taken on countries all over the world. And she was, shall we say, rather horrified by what he had to say. And so she burned them. Unfortunately, then, alas, we don't actually have, we do have his translation of the Kama Sutra and the Thousand and One Nights, but we don't have all of his notes on the peoples and places he visited in various parts of Africa, Asia, etc., etc. I think we do have, like, some of the more important reports, like his visit to Mecca and so on, but a lot of the rest of it was actually burned down by his jealous wife. So, to get back to the story of India then, things began to change when the British officers began bringing their wives. Not just because their wives kept an eye on them so that they behaved, but also because the British, shall we say, stopped trying to go native and started trying to actually convert people, or at the very least, force them to behave. I think we're at the end of the, the first hour, so when we get back, we're going to look at what we might call the classical age of imperialism, like in the late 19th century.